Well, just days before MPs vote on the Prime Minister's plan, the Brexit Select Committee has released a highly critical report on the deal. It says the plan fails to offer sufficient clarity or certainty about the future, and Theresa May's proposals are neither detailed nor substantive. And the chair of that committee is Labour's Hilary Benn, who joins us now. So what exactly has your committee found? Well, good morning, Sophie. Hi. Um, we've agreed unanimously a report. Now, we are a committee made up of people who campaign passionately for remain and for leave during the referendum. But as you yourself have said, we were promised a detailed and substantive political declaration on our future relationship. We haven't got one. It all it offers is uncertainty about the future. And the only thing we know for sure is the terms on which we will leave. But if you're a business looking five years ahead, 10 years, and you ask the question, so how's trade gonna work? What will happen to services, which is 80% of the British economy? The honest answer is you don't know because nobody knows. And we also say that the government has failed to make the choices that it will eventually have to make about how we trade off the different things that we want because the government's proposals put forward in checkers were rejected by the eu we say that canada wouldn't work it wouldn't solve the problem of northern ireland it wouldn't ensure the continuation of friction free trade which is so important to the british economy as we know that's why there's concern about what would happen at dover calais euro tunnel if we were to leave with no deal. We also observe as a committee that we think uh, there isn't likely to be a majority in the House of Commons for leaving with no deal. And that's something that we will test as part of the vote on amendments on Tuesday. Mm. Um, it, we've, you've been the chair of the committee for um, some time now. We're now on to the third Brexit secretary. We're going to be hearing from one of the former Brexit secretaries, Dominic Raab, a little bit later on the show. Uh, and one thing that seems to have come out from the previous Brexit secretaries is that they feel that they hadn't, weren't properly listened to, weren't properly involved, shall we say, in some of those negotiations. Do you think there's been a problem in how the negotiations have been carried out? Look, I think any Prime Minister is going to want to be directing what have been the most important negotiations that the country is engaged in for decades. And, you know, the dynamic between a Prime Minister and Cabinet Ministers, as I know from my own experience, in the end, the Prime Minister is going to want to decide what is going to happen. But so I think, but I think, there's, a, well, no, I think there's a much more fundamental problem, which has been for two years, the Cabinet was riven with disagreement. It was arguing amongst itself about what even to ask for. When we would meet Michel Barney, he would say, could you please tell us what it is you want as a country? That's the first problem. And second problem is I don't think the government's been honest with the British people about the choices we have to make. Because the other thing we say in our report today is the degree of access we're going to have in future will depend on the extent to which we are prepared to follow the rules of the people with whom we are trading. Now, that is a, a trade-off. That is a choice. And I'm afraid that the story of Brexit has been for too long, the impression was given, oh, don't worry, we can get everything we want, we can get rid of the things that we don't want. And now, finally, people have realised that is not true. And if you listen to those who argued for Brexit, they don't actually have a plan. Is it, is it Canada? Is it leaving with no deal and not paying well, our to be bills? Fair, people who back Remain hardly have a plan either. Some of them say that we should respect the result of the referendum. Others say that they want a second referendum. Others are talking about a Norway option. Which one do you want to see? It's easy to criticise other people, isn't it, for not having... I, I respected the outcome of the referendum. I voted to trigger Article 50. But it's quite clear that the deal that the Prime Minister has brought back is not going to succeed. I don't think it offers certainty. And the amendment that I put down for next Tuesday, as well as rejecting the Prime Minister's deal, also says the House of Commons rejects leaving with no deal. And I think that is really important because the, the, the two pit props of the Prime Minister's argument have been, well, it's either my deal or it's leaving with no deal. If Parliament with one vote says, well, neither of those is acceptable, then I think it puts pressure on the government to move. My own view is that uh, it would be more sensible to go for membership of the EA in a customs union. But if we cannot reach agreement on that, if Parliament remains deadlocked, then in the end we're going to have to resolve this one way or another. And it is just possible that the only way that can be achieved is by going back to ask the people again. But do you think this a is a very difficult process. Do you think there's a parliamentary majority for the EAA, this Norway plus option, staying in the single market and a customs union? Well, that has yet to be tested. Honest answer, Sophie, is I don't know. I don't think anybody does. There are clearly those in the government who would choose to move in that direction, 
if and when the government, the Prime Minister's deal is rejected. Labour's policy, of course, is to want to stay in a customs union to have a close relationship with the single market, which is pretty close to that. But n none of that is ideal because the, the fundamental weakness in all of these things is you are following rules over which you have no say. And also, have... in the EEA, you would also have to accept free movement of people, which is a big driver. No, that is, that is true. Uh, but I said in my speech did. in the House of Commons last week, in the end, either everyone is going to have to compromise because nobody is going to get everything they want out of this process. The trouble is our politics has become more polarised, but there is a, a strong inbuilt British desire to seek compromise where it is possible. But we'll have to see whether the House of Commons would be prepared to back that. Um, I wanted to ask you about your amendment. You mentioned it earlier, which yeah. effectively rules out the PM's deal, it rules out no deal. Yeah. Um, but I'm right in saying, aren't I, that if that amendment goes forward, people wouldn't necessarily have to vote on the Prime Minister's deal at all? Well, if it, if it were to be carried, then it becomes what's known as the substantive amendment, and you can have a second vote on it uh, if you want. But if it is carried, it would say Parliament is rejecting the Prime Minister's deal. It would have so you would be voting on the Prime Minister's so, deal. So you'd be letting her off the hook a bit, then, wouldn't you? Well, no, because if Parliament votes to reject the Prime Minister's deal, it votes to reject the Prime Minister's deal. That is not letting the Prime Minister off the hook. That is telling her, "I'm afraid your deal won't wash." But, it but means at, the same it, it's at the same time, it, it would be uh, significantly more difficult for the Prime Minister if she put this motion to the House, a motion she's worked on for more than two years and it was decisively uh, rejected. Well, of Wouldn't course, that be no, but, difficult for her? Well, no, I think in the end, if Parliament says, with one vote on the amendment that's got cross-party support, people from all parties, if Parliament says, we don't approve your deal, but crucially, we do not approve of leaving the European Union with no deal, I think we have she'd, an she'd, obligation... She would, she would not lose that vote by as many as she would lose... That is, that is, po she? That is possible. Because a lot of people but, on her own backbenchers would not support your amendment. Indeed, because some of them think you can leave with no deal. Now, I'm very clear, and if you look at the evidence, the assessments that have been done, the warnings from Kent County Council, talk to business. Never mind what politicians say about the impact of no deal. Just talk to business, as we have done, taken evidence as a committee, I have done, and ruling out leaving with no deal now, I think is really important for the future of the country, because otherwise you prolong the uncertainty. I don't think there's a majority in the House of Commons for leaving with no deal. I don't actually think the government would be foolish enough to say, OK, we are leaving with no deal, so why carry on pretending? Let's give Parliament the chance to say, clearly, we reject your deal, we also reject no deal, and then other possibilities will open up. So even if it saves the Prime Minister from a far heavier defeat, you're not going to be withdrawing your amendment? No, I think Parliament should have given the chance to reject no deal, because I think a cross-party amendment has a chance. It may be that all of the amendments go down and the Prime Minister's deal is also defeated. One cannot predict what the House of Commons will decide. We are a democracy. Well, that is uh, certainly true, if uh, recent weeks are anything to go by. Uh, Hilary Benn, thank, thank you, you very much.